Hello, you're here either because you asked me how to get better at Spy and got this in return, or you somehow wandered to it on your own. Whichever way it is, I'm happy to have you here and I hope you will find something that will be of use to you. Before we begin, I want you to know that this is not a guide for absolute beginners, since I will be explaining things with an assumption that you're familiar with how Spy's mechanics work, at least to a certain degree. If you don't feel comfortable playing Spy on a casual level, you may learn something here, but I strongly suggest checking out some of John Hill's content to learn the basics with ease and have fun. If you haven't seen his content, or you're not sure, here's a recap of a few topics that are worth mentioning. First of all, Spy is very difficult to learn because you can't just get better at fighting a certain class. Each player has to be fought differently since the reaction times and experience vary very much. Also, Spy is harder to practice since many things that work for other classes, such as MGE, tend to be a bit redundant for Spy, unless you have a friend that's helping you practice some specific things, such as Surf Slabs. There is also a Spy Academy, but I find that it's not very helpful for beginners since it's like Trolger fights. It's better to just leave enemy spies unless you get trickstabbed too much and you want to learn to avoid that. No matter where you choose to practice, think of it as choosing where to fail so you can succeed where it matters. Since dying is a learning process, think of it as of speedrunning. You spend very much time on a game, trying to spend less time on a game. In the same way as a spy, you die much, to die less in the future. What I mean by that is that I would much rather die 200 times in MG fighting my friend trying to get the surf stab on him than die 200 times in casual games failing surf stab. What I found to be helpful when it comes to failing less is recording your own gameplay. Analyzing why you failed or you succeeded in certain scenarios will help you get a better feeling for what you're doing wrong or right. That works especially well when learning advanced theories such as circle strafing since many things are hard to notice on the go especially at the start when you don't know what you're looking for all the time. After my games, I tend to go to the clips where I failed badly or where I nearly got a backstab and look at why and how I failed. What? Wait, what? Reviewing my footage also helped me to take down my spy ego down a notch. You come to realize that most of the times you fail stabs is because of you and you alone. Whatever it is, try not to look for excuses when you fail, but rather be eager to take responsibility for it and try not to repeat the same mistakes next time you play. With that out of the way, I have categorized mistakes that I see spy players make the most often into a few groups. First and foremost, by far the simplest category of mistakes to solve are stupid habits. The mistakes in this category are going to be very personal to each player, but here are my favorites. I fully understand you ADHD players that just need something to do when there's no action, but trust me, not doing it is just going to help you a ton. The reason I classify this as a mistake and not a harmless habit is that TF2, just like many other games, has a lot of cooldowns. In TF2, the cooldowns are not marked on a timer, but they're still there. Reloading weapons, weapon-specific uses such as the Deadringer, shooting stuff, and of course swapping weapons. Each time you change the weapon and activate or deactivate your cloak, you're put in a small cooldown until the action ends, and only then you can proceed fighting back. Needlessly swapping weapons just puts you in a stupid situation if you ever encounter an unexpected player. A corner stab that you could have reacted to can be missed even if you draw your knife the second you see the enemy's back. A projectile that could have been served with the Deadringer up can just kill you because you were spamming the Deadringer and missed the timing, and so on. Instead of going around a corner with a weapon roulette in your hands, just have your favorite weapon in your hand and you won't be caught off guard as often. There are situations where you may need to cloak or decloak quickly and pretend that you're an enemy, but if you're just in a habit to cloak and instantly disguise, or even worse, disguise and then cloak, you're practically putting on cement shoes on yourself. The reason to stay undisguised or even better have an undisguised bind is knockback. You see, no matter if you're cloaked or not, you're not going to get any knockback from damage when you're disguised, except from a few exceptions. In most cases, using that knockback to escape and relocate, or just put some distance between yourself and the enemy, can be the difference between you escaping or dying. Also, if you're cloaked and caught out, your best bet is to try running away. Very rarely is it a good idea to decloak and try to make your disguises work in the same situation. That's why it is a good habit to undisguise your own damage sources while cloaked that could knock you around, such as explosives or even sentries in some cases. The way you go around the map is one of the most important things to think about when playing the Spy. I see far too many players taking every corner very wide for whatever reason. 
It works when you're expecting enemies around the corner, or if you hope for a corner stab there, but other than that, you should be saving time by cutting all the corners you can get to places faster whenever you can. Not only does it help you be less predictable, but taking corners very wide may also leave you exposed in certain situations, since more often than not that corner is your way back to the safety. Talking about corners, why aren't most of you playing in advantageous positions? Spy's advantageous position is wherever he has a higher chance to get a stab. A disadvantageous position, however, is right here. Not to say that you're supposed to go behind the enemy's backs all the time and play by Mr. Paladin's preaching, but when you have a chance to be above an enemy when going around where enemies may be, just take that extra half a second to do so. If you're invisible, you may just avoid bumping into enemies, or avoid some spam damage, or you just may get a stab. And nothing puts you in a disadvantageous position as being that guy. What the fuck? This is John. Not me, well at least not anymore. John likes playing the spy and he wants to be the cool guy by showing off his trick stabs, but all he does is run into the enemy with a dead ringer and hope. Hope that his enemies are not the brightest and won't find him. However, John can't seem to be finding enemies that are dumber than a bucket, so he fails. Don't be like John, learn using all cloaks, not just the one that seems the coolest in frag movies. Don't get me wrong, the Dead Ringer is an awesome weapon and I have been using it almost exclusively in the recent days, but using it to only brute force your ways through your enemies really puts you on the back foot. But if you can't play the game with a weapon that allows you to appear practically anywhere on the map while staying permanently invisible, you're probably not going to do that well if the enemies can't see you all the time either. Every single one of you has seen a spy that's running around with an ambassador and hitting one in a hundred headshots. More often than not, I see spies not even waiting out the timing required to get another headshot and just spam body shots that are worse in every single way than most of the other revolvers. I am not asking you not to use a weapon that you like, but if you're using that weapon, actually use it to its fullest and don't just have it to be a weapon downgrade that makes you look like an idiot. And now we have come full circle to my Dead Ringer rant. The weapon that offers so much potential to escape. Fight power classes head on, surf damage and go for surf stabs or surf escapes, do long jumps without a need for tight maneuvers, close the distance between your enemies for trick stabs, hell, you can even trick people with the end disguise sound, and it gets used for this. Just dropping on the ground like a wet towel and quote unquote faking your death to just run into the enemy with no plan whatsoever. To conclude this section, aside from my rant for beginner spies, just take away the idea that we all do stupid mistakes. All we need to do to fix them is notice them, see what we're doing wrong, and try not to do it again. The fastest way to do this, as mentioned, is to rewatch your gameplay and see what's wrong with it. However, if there is nothing wrong with it, you're either a god or you're blaming others for what's wrong in your games to feel better about yourself. One of these options is a bit more common than the other, but who am I to judge? The next category has only one answer. Practice. The less fun kind. Basic skill issues are things that you're not confident in performing at least quite well. Sure, we all miss a stair stab here and there, but it doesn't mean that you should miss half of them when it's your fault. I know this sounds redundant, but practicing against bots to get consistent at a given motion, such as a stair stab, is a good thing. You may want to use TR walkway or TR corner stab for most of such practice, since those maps are designed for it. It's just like learning guitar, you start out slow with the movements, and over time you will learn to do them faster. The next level is practicing in controlled settings. Whether that is learning against bots or practicing with your friends, it's a reasonable step too to getting more specific practice that you may want. For example, certain things such as sentry surfing will not prove to be useful if learned in a very controlled environment. Sure, it's a good thing to practice the very basics of it offline with just you and the sentry, but I found it to be useful to go into practice games against bots. Once you're in the game, you can just add health to yourself and only go for the sentry surfs. You may think it's far from a casual experience since bots aren't the brightest, but you would be surprised how accurately some things play out when compared to casual. Jokes aside, such practice not only helps you to time your sentry serves when the sentry is unattended or safe to serve, but also it puts you in locations where sentries and the enemy players may actually be in the actual game. Which means that such practice in the end may prove a bit more useful than training in maps such as TR walkway once you've got the hang of the basic motions. Moving on is the category that has not one correct solution to your problems. 
Everything here will vary depending on how you have been learning spy to this point. What I have noticed is that there are two extremes of spy players when it comes to it. There are people that are learning spice theory and applying it in the game through experimentation and analyzing what went wrong, and there are people that rely on intuition and experience more than anything else. Before I explain my view on this, I believe that it's about time to mention that I'm not the best spy player there is. Not even close. There are spies that learn in either way that are far better than I am, so don't take my word for granted. I think that whichever way you're learning, you have a lot to learn and can become very good, but you have to understand that whichever way of learning you choose, you won't avoid the other. Let me explain. Intuition is having knowledge and applying this at knowledge without thinking of it. The way you obtain the knowledge is up to you, but my point is that with learning theory or without learning it, you will get a feeling for the things you're doing, and the things you do will be explainable by theory. Looking at it from a more different angle, you can see that theory becomes intuition and intuition becomes theory. For example, I was playing a game during which I was absolutely not thinking much, but the stabs I got here are absolutely level 1 circle strafes. Does it mean it's not theory just because I wasn't thinking? Of course not. All I want you to take away from this rumble is that you should find what works for you and keep an open mind, since playing spy is never just theory or just intuition, but a mixture of both, and seeing what way of learning works for you is far more important than most of the tips I can give you. Personally, I have both phases of learning theory based on in-game mechanics such as movement, but I also have days where I just want to stop analyzing everything and just play games with my intuition leading the way. Even though I look far too much into the theory behind a simple game, I think that learning any theory will never harm you if you learn the do's and don'ts of the said theory. As I have said, any theory you can find can work in your favor whether it's something as simple as when you matador people or more complicated stuff as a counter-to-counter -counter stab. With each of the theories do's come far more don'ts, but they usually are not mentioned in a simple tutorial since people come to see what works, not to see what doesn't. When you watch or rewatch anything related to Spy, I want you to really understand the reason things work, that way you stop applying theory where it's not supposed to be used, and instead use something fit for the given situation. And that will boil down to your experience. If, before you approach the enemy, you're already thinking of trickstabbing them in a specific manner, you failed my class. Premeditating stabs is where the downside of learning the game with theory rather than practice has its weakest point. Every one of us has found a new trickstab some time ago and just gone for that stab over and over and over again trying to get it. That happens because when it's brand new in our heads, it's exciting, it's fun. But it's also bad because if we're actively trying to use one thing over anything else before we even encounter the enemy, we are bound to fail most of the time. Think of it like this. We're not playing D&D &D and rolling for the success of our backstabs, we're trying to trick the opponent, and there is no tricking the opponent if you know what you will do before you even see the guy. While I'm not going to make you a god gamer with only niche things, they're still worth to learn. Especially if you've already covered all the basics. As you may have noticed already, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to maps and movement overall. I like seeing what the maps really have to offer, and I have already covered a part of it in my previous project. Here, however, I would like to discuss why and how I apply what I have learned from the maps into actual games when playing the spy. At the very beginning of me learning maps, I learned what I can get away with without being invisible. For example, when going through this filler room as any class, I will most likely just walk past the door and pay attention to the doorway where I'm headed, or where I may expect to see some enemies. Very rarely does someone check the stupid corner, since when walking past through the door, we've already saw the corner of the room and assumed that the room was empty. How about if we're coming through the other door, the other way around? The very obvious way to stop someone then would be to corner stab them, but that's a bit too obvious for my liking. Instead, just look at a sink stab I just did. I apologize. Granted, the stab only worked because I baited the person into chasing me, but it still does well to explain what I learned next. After getting a feeling for where the enemies are going to be looking when they enter through a door, I began learning map traps that can be used for trick stabs. The most obvious part of how to learn them is just to look around any room and think if either prop fits the following criteria. First of all, will you be easily seen climbing the prop by your target? If yes, don't go for it. For example, the sink that I used would be an absolute disaster to use if the enemy was chasing me from the other direction. 
One way to counteract that would be using low props to make the jump less predictable, since people are less scared of us by jumping at them if they don't think you have enough height to get onto their head. Either way, props that are around corners work best. But that is thanks to another reason. Since corners are likely places for corner stabs, people will be quite careful chasing a spy around them. And nothing gives you peace of mind as being reassured that the spy is not going to trickstab you when you were expecting it. Also, it doesn't have to be corners that you learn with. My general idea is to look for spots that appear right after obvious trickstabbing places, such as the stairs and the crude, since people tend to be very aware around such places. After you see you're not going for a trickstab, they seem to just think that you're out of tricks. Talking about tricks, would you like to do magic? Not the Halloween kind of magic, but appearing in places that you never were intended to appear to begin with. There are three ways that I know how to do it so far. First of all are pixel walks and they're the easiest to find and to learn properly. This topic also has more than enough information on them, whether it's from me or not, so you can go and learn it yourself. Second come long jumps. Long jumps let you jump across places that Spy usually would never reach regularly. I find that they are quite hard to get the hang of, especially if you're not using any binds, but with time they become easier. Without binds for long jumps, you may have to replace long jumps with a bunny hop or two into the jump. Most of the jumps you're seeing from me can be done without a bunny hop into the jump. Also, it's good to mention that you can always use a Deadbringer speed boost to get across long jumps very easily. Last and probably the least known way of getting around the map are pixel climbs. I was taught that they exist by a fellow spy player and damn are they hard to get the hang of. The reason they're not so well known is because not only are they hard to do, many of them are far harder to utilize when it comes to regular games. In comparison to long jumps and pixel walks, which you can use in every game, pixel climbs come in handy in rare situations where walking around the other way is just not an option. Now, I know that's going to be difficult to hear, especially as a spy player, but learning such mechanics becomes far easier if you become good at rocket jumping. If you've never rocket jumped in difficult maps, you'd be surprised how many such techniques can be used in there. For that reason, here's a quick list of what you may learn by just learning to rocket jump. First of all, there's wall bugging. It's great as a way to avoid fall damage or float in funny spots above passages, especially after surfing damage. Ramp sliding and surfing can be used in combination with sentry or rocket surfing on spy to look cool. Bunny hopping or learning bounces on soldier jump maps is a great way to get a feeling for them very reliably. You can use that for the before mentioned long jumps or just to build some speed to catch up to someone. And then there's one of the main things that I want to talk about, it's C-tapping. If you don't know what C-tap stabs are, they look like this. It seems like a stair stab but you jump off of your target instead of falling down after getting the stab. They can be used to chain people jumping from one person to another, stay above a crowd while collecting stabs, or even jump onto props after getting kills and so on. They can also be done while walking into any direction on top of the enemy to control the direction of your jump, but the timing becomes tighter. To learn about C-Taps, I offer you to watch this video for an explanation, or this video for an updated version of a script for C-Tap stabs using many jumps, if you choose to use the script that is. Before anyone gets upset about a script, C-Tap stab scripts are just as harmful as a scroll wheel jump, or an NG being able to destroy one building and build another one with one click. Talking about scripts and binds, here are a few more things that you may or may not want to use. First of all comes the undisguised bind, a button that makes you instantly undisguised no matter the situation. Second is a plus strafe bind. It's one suggestion for people who are struggling with pixel walks or pixel climbs. With that bind you can quite reliably get on top of a clip brush to stand on it, and all the bind does is transferring your strafing to your mouse. More in-depth information can be found here. Last but not least are competitive view models. Yes, it is a script, which removes the weapons of your chosen view models. I like having my ambassador turned off for better view while playing Gun Spy, but I don't like not seeing any other weapons in my arsenal, and this is a perfect solution. With that, we have come to an end, and I just have one last thing to say. Whenever players are fighting a spy, they expect the spy to know just as much as they do, or usually even less. Whatever you do, try learning more new things, look at all tutorials under the new light, and do things your own way, since the last thing people expect from spies these days is being different than all the other spies they have already killed before. And for my sake, please stop having the idea that certain players are not backstabbable.
we all are. And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Thank you for watching and bye bye.